In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the major influences on the first document of uh, Catholic social thought, Rerum Novarum. The first um, actor we're going to take a look at, or the first influence, is Wilhelm Emanuel von Kettler. He was a German theologian, politician, and bishop of Mainz, Germany, from, uh, and he was born in 1811 and died 1877. Although he's known more of a man of ac known more as a man of action than as an intellectual, his ideas had profound influence on Leo the Thirteenth and Rerum Novarum. Some of his ideas um, included the prohibition of child labor, the limitation of working hours, separation of the sexes at work, closing of unsanitary workshops, Sunday rest, care for disabled workers and state inspection of factories. Um, none of these were written into the laws of any of the states in Europe at the time, and um, uh, von Kettler was um, instrumental in attempting to get these kinds of things, like the limitation of working hours, rather than being forced to work 16-hour days, seven days a week, he was, you know, uh, um, uh, asking for Sundays off, for instance, and these sorts of things. Um, another influence on, another major influence on Rerum Navarum was the Freiburg Union, and which was a which was a lay group consisting mostly of influential Catholic aristocrats. Um, it relied mostly on traditional theological categories taken from Saint Thomas Aquinas, who was a medieval theologian. They demonstrated concern for industrial workers and were opposed to laissez-faire capitalism. Their basic tenets were that charity was not enough. Charity was too individualistic. That the just wage um, needed to be um, established um, against individual employment contracts between employer and employee and for this idea of, of a state just wage being imposed on um, employers for the sake of employees. Why? Because the idea that um, in an employer-employee contract um, this wasn't a fair contract, that one party to the contract had much more power than the other and would therefore exploit that power and um, exploit the worker. They believed in the, that the state had to intervene against laissez-faire capitalism at times in order to rein in the power of uh, capitalists and their, uh, their oppressive ways. Um, they also believed that private property was not an absolute value. That, um, and in fact, this was the beginning of discussions of an income tax that the state had the right to um, confiscate uh, a small percentage of someone's property in order to distribute this in a way that is more equitable. They also believed in this corporatively organized society, much like the medieval guilds, and this will have an effect on Rerum Novarum, which has, has a section on uh, the corporatively organized society. Ultimately, this is going to have more an effect on the second document of Catholic social thought, Quadragesimo Anno, which will have a whole section dedicated to this idea of a corporatively organized society. Finally, the third influence I want to talk about are the Social Catholics, which was a loose organization of lay people and clergy who believed the central mission of the church was to engage in social action. In fact, a fellow Vincentian, Frederick Ozenam, a Vincentian layman, is considered one of the founders of, Catholic, of social Catholicism. Its basic beliefs were that they had this nostalgia for medieval social political structures, um, and you can see this again and again with their reference back to guild systems and their idealization of the life 
um, the politics and the economics of that era. They believed in a, and, and we'll see that actually, that nostalgia for medieval structures reflected in Rerum Navarum. Um, they believed in this middle way, or via media, the belief that the solution to our conflict was to be found by finding a balanced position between two extremes. Neither, so they're the ones who came, come up with this idea that uh, our, our economic strivings should be neither individualistic nor collectivistic, but should be something somewhere in between. They reject both individualism and, and collectivism, as I said, and they're against alienated labor. They're against this idea, and of course alienated labor is an idea that comes out of um, an analysis and criti criticism of industrial capitalism, uh, the factory floor. This idea that people spend their entire day making only a fraction of a product that they never actually see, uh, consume, um, or do anything with is very different than our labor of the past when, for instance, um, uh, someone who was a leather worker would make a wallet and that person would be involved in the making of that wallet from the very from taking the the hide off of the cow to the moment that the last stitch is sewn in the wallet and that wallet is then sold at market uh, at some kind of open market to the consumer um, that's a kind of labor that's not alienated from the product and from the, the, the act of um, producing something. Um, that kind of labor is very involved and with, with the product from the very beginning to its, to its ultimate sale. Modern factory work, um, according to Marx, Hegel, and other critics of modern factory work was that the factory worker was alienated from the product itself. The, 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 the factory worker didn't design the product, didn't, um, didn't uh, mine the raw materials, didn't form them into parts, um, but ultimately the factory worker was just screwing a screw in all day long and never saw the fruits of their labor, and never was involved in the sale of that product, in the profits that were gained from that product. Um, and this was, of course, ultimately the theory against factory work and alienated labor. The Social Catholics also were um, uh, great proponents of the common good. And they believed that all property, all kinds of property, had a social purpose. They believed in the priority of duties over rights, um, and therefore focused on a person's um, duties to society and the common good. These are the main um, influences.